For Criminal Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomulikai. Joining me today is Institute for Economics and Peace spokesperson Steve Kilalai here to unpack the findings from the 18th edition of its Global Peace Index. So this week marked the launch of the 18th edition of the Global Peace Index from the international think tank, the Institute for Economics and Peace. So what does the report identify as the greatest risk to global peace? And why has there been a surge in major conflicts? Well, it's a rather dark report this year. In fact, I think it's the gloomiest report since we started the Global Peace Index in 2008. So if we're looking today, there are 56 conflicts raging. That's the most number of conflicts since the end of the Second World War. We also see in 2023 that 97 countries deteriorated in peace. That's the most since the inception of the index. We can also see that more countries are involved in international conflicts beyond their borders than any time since the inception of the Global Peace Index in 2008. So that makes the conflicts much more difficult to solve. So this surge in unsolved the uh, conflicts or what can be sometimes termed forgotten wars or forever wars is, is troubling. If we went back to 2019, we looked at Ethiopia, Gaza, and the Ukraine. They were all considered minor conflicts. That's conflicts with greater than 25 deaths, but still what was considered minor conflicts, and they have erupted. So unless we can get on top and start to solve many of these minor conflicts, then in the future we'd likely see a deterioration in a global peacefulness through more raging large conflicts. And just to bring bring it home how the dynamics have changed, we went back to 1970s. 49% of all conflicts resulted in a, blip, in a victory for either the rebels or for the government. That dropped to 9% in the 2010s. Similarly, over the same period in the 19, 1970s, 23% of all conflicts finished with a peace agreement. That was 4% in the 2010s. So as you can see, you add those two together, 87% of conflicts in the 2010s didn't end up with a solution. So I guess from our angle, there's an urgent call for governments to really start to think about these conflicts and start to look at how they can actually go about solving the ones which can be solved. This also comes with a great economic cost. So what are the priority areas must government intensify efforts in? Well, I think, obviously, if we're looking at the, these 56 uh, conflicts, uh, many of them are in sub-Saharan Africa. I'd say, I think about the more than 40%. So I think there's a need to be able to look at what are the drivers of these conflicts in which ones are most likely to be able to get solutions to and the ones with the biggest uh, impact on regional security and peace. And so obviously, if we're looking up in the Sahel, that's probably the most stressed area of Africa currently. So obviously, there's a lot of ecological de degradation up there. Uh, you've got the Islamic uh, terrorist organisations operating. In fact, if we went and looked at 2023, there were uh, more people killed in terrorism in the Sahel than the rest of the world combined. We can go down and we can look at Sudan. Obviously, we've got a, 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 a conflict raging there. And that sort of has got a multiple a, international actors engaged on both sides. So there's a need, and I think particularly if we're African situation, there's a need for the African Union and SADAC to be taking the lead in trying to be able to work out how to, so how, to, how to solve them. And the report also suggests that 110 million people are either refugees or internally displaced owing to violent conflict with 16 countries now hosting more than half a million refugees. So what solutions should the world be looking at to tackle this issue? Well, I think the first thing is when we're looking at most of these refugees, they're refugees from conflict. So again, it's back to how do we actually stop conflicts and starting new ones, new ones from starting. Quite often when people are displaced with conflict, they don't go back. It's different than if there was a natural disaster because people who are displaced through natural disasters, usually within six months, 
that 90% of them are back to where they come from. But that's not the, not the case with people displaced through conflict. So I think there's a need for the international community to fund more to help many of these refugees. There are some really quite creative uh, things happening inside Africa in terms of trying to uh, help refugees. I was recently up in Uganda, uh, up on the uh, border areas with the uh, with the South Sudan, and in many in this in this area, Jamundi, uh, uh, there are eight hundred and thirty thousand Ugandans and eight hundred and seventy thousand refugees from the, uh, South Sudan. And so what they've done is the government had given each of the uh, uh, each of the uh, uh, refugees a small plot of land, about 40 metres by 40 metres. That's enough to get a house. And it's enough to get some a vegetable garden to get some basic nutrition. And from there, then, they absorbed them into the community, as the, into, in, into the local workforce. And in many cases, they were doing farming. They were renting the land from Ugand Ugandans and forming cooperatives uh, uh, to work together. So there are crea creative solutions, but quite often it does take money. And I think the international community were watching overseas developmental aid drop. But I think in the case of the refugees, that, re that really needs to be prioritised over many other things. And how significant do you think is the rise in global militarization and heightened international strategic competition? Well, I think we're looking at this, that this is a troubling trend. And a lot of it is driven uh, uh, by uh, the Ukraine war, uh, Russia becoming a, a, a militar militarised industrial complex. So if we're looking at Russia, for example, we look at the new head of the defence forces. He was a civilian economist. And the aim of that is to take the Russian economy and gear it around a war effort. So now once you do that, that may be a, a good for the Ukraine, but very, very hard to undo once you stop. So responses to that and to the Ukraine war, we're now seeing most European countries actually increasing their levels of militarization. Similarly, we look into the South China Sea and we see the rise of militarization within China. Now that's coming back and affecting those places as well. So I think if we went back and we looked since the inception of the Global Peace Index in 2008, what we find is that up until 2022, the average country had been decreasing its militarization. But that reversed in 2022, and that corresponds with the invasion of the Ukraine. So in 2023, what we find is that 108 countries increase their militarization, and that trend will continue for the next, uh, yeah, we believe, for, probably for the next five years, because once you start those things in motion, they take time to undo. And I guess that comes back to the uh, opening uh, comments I made about we've got more conflicts now at any stage since the Second World War, and they're not getting resolved. And I think one of the paradoxes with modern conflicts, because of the rise of asymmetric warfare, it's getting very, very difficult for even the most uh, powerful countries to be able to manage and maintain military victories. We're seeing it in the Ukraine. We saw it with the US in Iraq. We saw it in Afghanistan as well. And there's plenty of other examples in different parts of the world. And lastly, Steve, in what ways has the rise in global conflict impacted the performance of the world economy in recent years? And also, what can be done to improve the performance of the global economy for the sake of improved security? Yeah, look, it's a very good question. So if we're looking at the cost of violence of the global economy in 2023, that was 19.1% trillion dollars. So just give you an idea, that's 13.5% of global GDP, or the equivalent of about $2,400 for every person on the planet. Now, there are 80 countries in the world where the per capita income is less than that, 80 countries. Now, none of us can imagine a world which is peaceful, but we can all imagine a world which is 10% more peaceful. That's about $1.9 trillion. That's like adding three new economies to the world, the size of Ireland, Switzerland, and Denmark. Another way of being able to look at this also, 1% is the equivalent 
for overseas developmental aid in 2023. But as we start to look at peacekeeping, it's only about 0.2% of all the money spent on peacekeeping and peacebuilding. So we could put more money into those efforts which would then build the resilience of many of these countries, they're less likely to slip into conflict. So I think that part of it is very, very important. And the impact on the global economy is really quite profound. So I'll give you an idea. If we're looking at Syria, its economy dropped 87% in the first 10 years of the conflict. If we look at the Ukraine, its economy dropped 29% in the first year. So you can see as you extrapolate this, and particularly for many countries in Africa, it's 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 really key. So the countries most affected by conflict, 30% of their GDP is consumed by the conflict, whereas in the most peaceful countries, it's about 4%. So these are, these are vast sums I'm talking about, vast sums. And so I think in many cases, there's a need for business to be able to realise that peace is in its best interests. And there are ways of building peace. There's a concept called positive peace, which is the attitude, institutions, and structures which create and sustain peaceful societies. So with that, the very things which create peace also create an optimal environment for human potential to flourish because those qualities called positive peace are also statistically linked not only to peace, but to higher per capita income, like 2% higher GDP growth rates compared to countries which are dropping in positive peace, better performances on well-being and happiness, better performance on ecological measures, and also much better performance on development. So with that, I think there's an urgent need for governments and business to be a lot more cognizant of just the economic benefits of peace. And obviously the human suffering with all this stuff is, is shocking. So we don't want to uh, ignore that. But for many pragmatic people, economics does move them. That was Steve Killelai speaking to Prima Media's policy about the findings from the 18th edition of its Global Peace Index.